Good afternoon. Welcome to the, uh, I think it's the 14th of our 19th winter lectures here at Gettysburg National Military Park. For those who don't know me, I'm John Heiser, one of the historians here at the park. I've been here for years, uh, uh, quite a long time. It's been a wonderful, wonderful career and a great place to work. Um, the th general theme in the winter lectures has been turning points of the Civil War, turning points in American history that lead to the Civil War and the aftermath. Uh, I, I think historians really like to look at any war as having a turning point. Uh, in the American Revolution, I think it was the Battle of Saratoga. Uh, World War II, Battle of Midway in the Pacific, D-Day in the, Mediterranean, in the uh, Eastern European theater, Stalingrad on the Russian front, Vietnam War, it was Tet, the Tet Offensive. It's not just the military turning point, but it's also the social and political turning points that make a difference in a war. And here we are at Gettysburg, which is the, <laughs> we think, <laughs> right? Uh, I've heard the same argument that Antietam may be the real turning point of the war. I've heard the same argument that the Battle of Bull Run is a turning point in the war. Gettysburg certainly is a turning point of the war, a major turning point of war. It's the high water mark of the Confederacy, because never again will Robert E. Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia get so close to victory as they did here on this battlefield that we are at today. I want to talk, though, about another event that I consider to be a real turning point of the Civil War, which occurred a year after this battle, and that is in the wilderness of Virginia, a small, innocuous crossroads which you go by today, if you blink, you miss it. There's something event that happened there in 1864 that made a big difference in the way the war turned out to this final end at Appomattox Courthouse. It has to relate with Ulysses S. Grant. Let's look back at Washington wartime. In December of 1863, Union war aims are not succeeding very well. Uh, the Lincoln administration's at a uh, they're at a, basically a stone wall. Despite the victories in 1863 at Vicksburg, Mississippi, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, that fall they've had countless disappointments, countless misery, and nothing is succeeding. Uh, after the election of 1864, right, after the election that's going to be coming up, there's still a very strong feeling in the North against war aims, that we're not succeeding, we're not doing anything, we're just losing men, material, for no purpose at all. Uh, there is a real pursuit again with Lincoln about suing for peace, meeting with the Confederate agents and suing for peace. Uh, that is not the ultimate war aim, that's not the aim of the United States government. It is to pursue the war, put down the rebellion completely. And that is Lincoln's war aim. He has to have somebody who can at least lead that mission get that same idea that he has ultimately to ultimate victory, no matter what the cost is. So in that same vein, in December of 1863, the discussion comes up, they need to have a better leader running all of the armies. Elihu Washburn, who is the uh, senator from <coughs> Illinois, Republican senator, introduces a bill in Congress to create the position of lieutenant general. Lincoln approves of that. He thinks it's a great idea. We need to have somebody, but he has somebody in mind, and that is Ulysses S. Grant. Everyone knows who in this room knows Ulysses S. Grant. You know the name. You've heard it before. Why is Lincoln so attracted to this one officer? Why is he so attracted to him? What is it about Ulysses S. Grant that makes him something special to Abraham Lincoln? Lincoln decided to choose Grant over many others for a number of reasons. And I think the best summation is in Lincoln's own words. Grant, in all of his campaigns, from the very beginning of the war until December of 1863, had succeeded in his mission without complaining for more material, more guns, more men. He'd taken the resources he had, used them to his fullest extent, and was successful. In September of 1861, Grant had taken a small force from Cairo, Illinois, down the river to Paducah, Kentucky, to secure it from the Confederate threat, secure the city without firing a shot. If anything, that brought Grant to Lincoln's attention. This man could succeed without complaining about having more troops, not having enough, 
not having enough men and material to do it, he just did it. Now granted, Grant is now rising through the ranks. He's getting more attention in the West. He becomes a major general. Battle of Shiloh occurs the following year, of which he says we weren't surprised. We knew that it was coming. Well, ultimately, in historical study, yes, the Battle of Shiloh was a surprise. Grant and Sherman were surprised there, but ultimately they won the battle. They turned the tide just through their own determination and actually the determination and strength of their own men in that army. But Grant was somebody who was used to winning and doing it in a dogged, determined style. And that's maybe what really attracted Lincoln to Grant and the qualities he had as a leader. Many people who knew Grant, and that includes politicians, friends, and even those in the army, often abandoned Grant for a number, one reason or another, either bad press, criticism in the papers, criticism from congressional leaders, politicians, whatever. But if anything, Lincoln stood by him until the entire way. As Absalom Marklin, who was a uh, uh, spokesman at the time, said, other friends may have wavered in their friendship for General Grant and even recommended his removal from command, but Abraham Lincoln was faithful to General Grant through evil and good report both. So who was Ulysses Simpson Grant? He was born in Ohio in 1822. His father, Jesse, had, was a dry goods merchant, had a booming business that grew through time. And Grant had some of the best schools. He had good schooling, but he wanted to go to West Point. Got the appointment, went to West Point, graduated 1843, number 21 in the class of 39. He was not an exemplary student, not an outstanding student, wasn't always perfect on the, cadet, on the uh, uh, drill field as a cadet, but he was good, studious general, or officer, cadet rather. <laughs> Confused myself, jumping ahead of myself. He was a good cadet, and when he succeeds and gets out of service and becomes a second lieutenant of the 4th Infantry, moves to St. Louis, he does a pretty good job as a young lieutenant in the Army. While in St. Louis, he meets his future wife, Julia Dent. Grant is quickly bored by Army service. There's not much excitement to it. But he does his duty resiliently until, fortunately, there's a war, war with Mexico. But instead of leading troops in the field, Grant is what? A quartermaster. That's his primary job in the war with Mexico. In the aftermath, he does experience, because of attachments to headquarters, he does experience how armies operate. That experience is really useful to him in the future. But still now it's going right back to the same old boredom on army bases. Though he gets married, they move to Sackett Harbor, New York, I believe, an army post there. Only there for a while before Grant then is reassigned out west. Eventually winds up in <laughs> California, away from his family. And it's that period of time, the two years that he is in California, separated from his family, that he has issues with depression, has migraine headaches, and to resolve that, he medicates himself with alcohol. Really, he's no different in his drinking habits than most other officers in the United States Army at that time. Everybody drank. Everybody did. Grant was known to drink quite a bit to excess. And that, unfortunately, became part of his memory of him. And it carried over, especially by those who did not think very much of Ulysses S. Grant. But Grant got sick of the Army, quit, resigned, moved to St. Louis, bought a farm, tried his hand at farming. He didn't like that, didn't work very well. It was just really hard work being a farmer. Quit that, went to the real estate business with a uh, cousin of his wife, didn't like that very much. He just could not really collect on rents. He didn't like confronting people. Eventually, by 1860, he was really running short of money, running short of funds to support his family. He accepted a job with his father in the dry goods business back in Ohio. But then the war breaks out. Volunteers for service and through connections with the state of Illinois becomes the colonel of the 21st Illinois Infantry. But within two months, he's given the rank of, Brevet, of Brigadier General of Volunteers. So there's something about Grant that he is early, quickly recognized by officers in the West as well as most of the War Department this man has a certain talent at getting things accomplished and getting things done. And that carries over with Lincoln's recognition of Grant with the event at Paducah, Kentucky, September of 1861. By 
1863, Grant has a number of great victories under his belt, most notably the siege of Vicksburg, the fall of Vicksburg in July 1863. That secures the Mississippi River under your control. Now the Confederacy is completely surrounded, given the Union blockade around the coast, control of the Mississippi River, it's Grant's success. And though people question Grant the entire time of all the battles around Mississippi and the siege of Mississippi, some demanding that he be relieved of duty and sent elsewhere, Lincoln sticks by him. And on July 5th, Lincoln himself writes that he would trust Grant to do anything, because Grant, once again, does the job, gets the job done without demanding a lot of extra excess. That fall, when Rosecrans Union Army fights the Battle of Chickamauga, Northern Georgia, in September 1863, and they're thrown back into Chattanooga, they get bottled up. It turns into a siege. Rosecrans' army is surrounded, and Rosecrans himself is kind of standing there scratching his head, what do I do now? Grant is sent to Chattanooga, given command of the forces October 22nd. Within three weeks, the supplies are now rolling back into Chattanooga. The army is reinforced, and November 22nd to the 25th, the army fights its way out of Chattanooga, sending the Confederate army back into northern Georgia. That's a huge victory for Grant. And Grant himself quietly, resolutely, gets the job done without complaining, demanding anything else. If anything, that's the type of person that Abraham Lincoln needs to lead all the Union armies, and that's why he's a favorite. Physically, Grant is not an imposing person. There's nothing really about him that really stands out. He's very thin, he's 135 pounds, he's only five feet 10, um, hardly has any expression on his face. Even on his friends, he doesn't express a lot, uh, just laughs every now and then, chuckles every now and then. But he, what's remarkable about him, uh, Horace Porter, who's one of his staff officers and writes a great memoir of service with Grant, says that he has a voice that is extremely clear it's almost musical in tone. And even speaking at a normal tone, that voice carries across a crowded camp. It was really quite remarkable. So you would think, looking at Grant, character-wise, that he'd have the rough, grumble type of low voice, but he didn't. He spoke really in a musical tone. His only strange uh, habits is when he would sit, he often stroked his beard with his left hand. With his right, he would maybe make a point tap on the table or back to his leg, tabletop, back to his leg. That's how he made his points. Otherwise, he was a great listener. He listened to anything anybody said. And oftentimes, that uh, may be the best quality of any leader, is listening to what other people have to say. But what else is up here um, that, um, that uh, Porter has to say about him? Grant had one small peculiarity to his face, and. Uh, Porter points this out, kind of like Cromwell, Lincoln, and many other great leaders. He had one small wart on his face. I think it was on his right-hand side, just above his beard. That was the only bad quality to his, to his looks. A square jaw, square face, really quite a handsome man, but very slight. And he always walked with kind of a stooped attitude. His, he never stood up straight. Uh, never walked in step with anybody. He just walked from one point to another. He just walked at his own pace. So very unmilitary in a lot of ways. But uh, Lincoln was absolutely sure he was the man. And when legislation was passed, the Senate creating the position of Lieutenant General, Abraham Lincoln sent a nomination right to Congress. Ulysses S. Grant would be his man to command all the Union armies, all of them. So now Grant's role is going to change from army commander to commander of all of the Union armies, and his attitude it's going to have to change. His strategy is going to have to change from one theater, the theater of Tennessee and Georgia, to a huge theater of how to defeat the Confederacy. So Grant receives the order on November 3rd, he knows, or March 3rd. He knows it's going to come sooner or later. Uh, there's words passed down to him from Washburn and his representatives. He's going to get the nomination and the rank of Lieutenant General, command of all the armies. He writes. His friend, William Tecumseh Sherman, on March 2nd, uh, saying that he'll kind of reluctantly accept the rank. One thing he will not do is put his headquarters in Washington, D.C. That is a condition that he will levy with the president. I'll take the rank, but I will not stay here in Washington. If anything, Grant recognized the problem in the East is the political atmosphere. 
and the political connections with the Army of the Potomac. He really thinks that's one reason the Army of the Potomac has had so many issues and so many problems is too much political interference. The West is completely different. They don't have that much political interference, apart from a few political officers out there, that they have in the East. So Grant receives the order, goes to Washington, and where he meets the president for the first time. Um, he was reluctant <clears throat> to accept that rank, Lieutenant General. It was, it was a completely different assignment from what he had done for the previous years of the war. And now he has to think, like I said, something much broader, a huge, larger strategy of how to defeat the Confederacy, not just in the East or the West or the Far West, but the entire complex issue of how to do this. Um, Grant is not really happy in a lot of ways, but he doesn't mind taking on this duty because he feels responsible to that duty. He's an Army officer, tried and true. Despite the fact he left the Army, he came back and became one of the best Army officers. Uh, Grant got his wish. He didn't have to make his headquarters in Washington, D.C. And within a couple of days, he laid out a plan of how they were going to attack the Confederacy in 1864. Uh, reluctantly, he had to accept political appointments. Uh, Halleck, Henry Halleck and Abraham Lincoln both said, you have to accept General Nathaniel Banks and Generals Benjamin Butler as officers in command of armies. If anything, he still had William Tecumseh Sherman he could depend on. Grant depended on Sherman for a lot of things because the two thought so much alike. Banks and Butler were questionable because of their political, because of the uh, political attachments, but also because they were just mediocre generals at best. But still, Grant thought of the prospects of how he's going to attack. And like he had done before, he's going to use every last resource he has, all of the armies all at once, to attack the Confederacy to throw them completely off balance. In Louisiana, he would send banks, Army of the Trans-Mississippi, against the Confederate forces there. In the center, William comes to Sherman would strike towards Atlanta through northern Georgia, striking that arrow right into the heart of the Confederacy. In the east, Butler would take the Army of the James, threaten Richmond, while the Army of the Potomac then would strike towards Richmond, going through Lee. Grant then chose to put his headquarters with Meade. And on May, March 10th, when he visited the Army of the Potomac, and had his first interview with George Gordon Meade, he told him at that time that my headquarters will be in the field with you. Uh, Grant came away from his visit with the Army of the Potomac impressed about how the quality of the Army, how well it was disciplined, how well it dressed. We also realized there were issues with the Army system itself, and there was so much infighting within the command system itself between corps commanders and division commanders, brigade commanders, he thought the politics that are involved in this army have got to stop. That's one reason he chose to be with the army. The other reason was he was realized that he's facing a brand new enemy. Not like he had faced in the Western Theater in Tennessee and Georgia and Mississippi. Robert E. Lee is a completely new animal. Comparison of the two. In some ways, um, they're very much alike. Both think on broader areas than just the placement of an army or a simple campaign. They think out, what we call today, think outside the box. Lee, if anybody, was thinking further beyond Northern Virginia as far as Confederate strategy was concerned. Now Grant is tasked with that as well. And both share the quality of determination to get the job done. The question is, Grant wonders if Lee is as sly a fox as people say he is. Lee is willing to take chances, use opportunities to take those chances. And he's done so countless times the, the minute he took command of the Army of the Virginia uh, through the Gettysburg Campaign until the end of 1863. Grant is, uh, let's say, doesn't really throw caution to the wind, but he's more determined to get the job done. So the two of them, in some ways, are comparable to that. But it's, it's quite a dichotomy you've got going on here between somebody who comes from completely different backgrounds, where Lee has been a career officer all of his life, Grant in and out of the Army, bored with Army life, gets back into it, but still can officially do the job. But the real strategy Lee realizes is he has to face Robert E. Lee and a completely different Army. As uh, Grant wrote later on, 
the advice we staff during the planning process, the force opposed to the Army of the Potomac was the strongest, the best led, and the best appointed Army in Confederate service. Grant recognized that readily, and rightly so. Army of Northern Virginia was not like the wretched legions, and I have to attribute this quote to a friend of mine, nobody historical, but it's very true. The armies in the West were very, very different than the Army of Northern Virginia in the East. Had to do with leadership, had to do with organization, had to do with morale, and the general spirit of that army. And maybe being in Virginia, defending the capital of the Confederacy, had a lot to do with that. Because if you don't stop the Yankees in Virginia, very soon they're gonna be in the Carolinas, or Georgia, or Alabama, or your home in Texas. So the men there knew there was a lot more on the line than maybe people realized. And the man who was gonna lead them was Robert E. Lee. Completely different army. On the other hand, Lee is probably wondering about Grant, because Grant's really an unknown commodity to him. As far as Lee is concerned, George Gordon Meade is still the commander of the Army of the Potomac. But who is this Grant? What, what makes him tick? What is his strategy? How does he run an army? How does he manage? The only thing Lee knows about Grant is from the Vicksburg campaign, victories in Tennessee, what he did at Chickamauga, victories from what he reads in the paper. He does some, get some really good, strong advice, though, from officers who knew Grant long before the war. And one is James Longstreet, who tells him, that man will fight us every day and every hour till the end of the war. And Longstreet is clear, absolutely right. So while the Army of Northern Virginia is a different animal, Grant decides that he's got to take the task right to the Army. He tells Meade, uh, and his orders on April 9th, your objective is to drive towards Richmond, but your primary objective is one thing, Robbie Lee, Army of Virginia. You'll fight him wherever you find him, and you will fight it out on that line if it takes all summer. That's what he tells Lincoln. That's what he tells Meade. You will fight Lee wherever we find him. You get a hold of him, never let go of him. You're going to grapple with him. And so the situation, the terrain they have to fight over, is this area here, west of Fredericksburg, Spotsylvania County, south of the Rapidan, Rappahannock Rivers. This area is called the Wilderness, uh, well known at that time for being the Wilderness because it was a pretty wild area, very rural, very remote. For years, since pre-colonial times, it had been logged out over and over and over again to feed the iron furnaces that populated the area. By the 1860s, those furnaces, the iron ore, is given out. So what has grown back is basically a thick, tangled woodland very wild, very hard to farm. No one's farming it. It's just basically wild woodland and young trees. There are areas with larger trees, but that is also complicated with thick understories, thick undergrowth. It's a very, very dense area. Both armies are used to this. They fought there at the Battle of Chancellorsville, May 2nd, 1863. So this is the area they're gonna fight. Army of the Potomac is north of the Rapidan at Brandy Station. Army of Northern Virginia is south, centered around Orange Courthouse to the west. On May 4th, the campaign begins. The Army of Potomac numbers approximately 122,000 officers and men as they cross the Rapidan River on May 4th. Uh, they're joined by the 9th Army Corps under Ambrose Burnside. And a shout out to John Hoptak, who's a big man with the 9th Army Corps. Uh, very interested, especially the 48th Pennsylvania. Uh, so the 9th Army Corps joins and reinforces them 122,000 officers and men. It's a huge army that crosses that river that day. It takes them all day and into the night. And even by nightfall, there's still troops that are waiting on the north side of the Rapidan to cross. Part of the 6th Corps is still over there. And a lot of the baggage is still over there. But the army crosses and begins their campaign towards Richmond that day. Grant crosses with his staff, accompanied by Meade and his headquarters staff, they spend that first night north of the, uh, what is the crossroads known as the Orange Plank Road and the uh, uh, Brock Road area, excuse me, or the uh, turnpike that goes to Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville. Uh, things are pretty quiet that night. Lee reacts by then getting his troops up, moving towards this threat. Now it's coming around his flank and drives towards 
Fredericksburg, stopping that night. But early the next morning, he decides he's going to attack the Army of the Potomac in the wilderness. He only has, at this point, barely 50,000 men. He's outnumbered two to one. But he realizes if he catches the Army of the Potomac in the wilderness, catches him in the woods, the Union Army cannot bring its artillery to bear. He knows by that time the Union artillery, has, they have about more artillery than he does, of a better quality. If he can somehow put them out of the battle, he has a chance. And the wilderness is perfect because the area is so thickly wooded, there's only a few small clearings along the turnpike nearby that artillery can be used, but it limits how much artillery can be used in the fighting there. So he'll use his infantry and to cover the woods to attack the Army of the Potomac. Has anybody, everybody here been to the battlefield of the wilderness? Uh, it's very different today than it was in 1864. Uh, I have to admit, even by the time that I was first there in the 1970s, it's changed quite a bit. But uh, it still is pretty much of a wild area. As the battle opens on May 5th, Army Potomac is now stretched out from the Orange Turnpike, which runs to Orange, Virginia, and then eventually to Fredericksburg, and then along the Brock Road, which runs to Spotsylvania Courthouse, about 10 miles south of there. Hancock's Second Corps is attacked by A.P. Hill's Corps. The battle first develops along the Orange Turnpike with Richard Ewell's Second Corps attacking the Fifth Corps and eventually the Sixth Corps. The battle becomes a huge inferno. Fighting rages throughout the day. A lot of back and forth movement, especially along the Orange Turnpike. This one area, Saunders Field, uh, this is where the battle first begins. It's where it develops and sees some of the most intense fighting back and forth. It's one of the few cleared areas in the wilderness. And what's uh, characteristic of, think of the fight in the Battle of the Wilderness is here, with the limited use of artillery, there's a lot of infantry charges back and forth across this field. It's fighting around in the woods itself, but from there, that's the core of the fighting. The north part it extends off into the thickest part of the woods, the densest part, as hard for troops to maneuver in. I think this illustration by Keith Rocco was pretty good in that it illustrates the type of close-in infantry fighting that occurred there around the edges of Saunders Field, not just on May 5th, but the following day on May 6th as well. Some of the other characteristics of the wilderness fighting was the density of the woods. Even though there were mature trees in there at the time, a lot of the understory covered, even with no leaves on it, covered approaches. So troops were stumbling into each other. And once the firing got started, the dense smoke really hung under those trees and troops could not see each other. There was a feeling, as one veteran wrote, of isolation fighting, even though you were standing side by side once the smoke rolled in, you could not see each other to either side of you. You could not see the enemy. It was this feeling of isolation there in the middle of fighting of the wilderness. This eyewitness sketch by Alfred Wode uh, is a pretty uh, a great example of how close the battle lines could be, but then suddenly obscured from view by that dense smoke. Another view that Wode uh, drew, this is not more than a mile away from the Army Potomac headquarters where Grant was during the campaign. And again, it shows some of the density fighting in the woods, how woods were thick. And it was very easy, if you left a gap, for the enemy to get through both ways. The Confederates did their best to charge, counter charge, were thrown back again and back and forth. It was such a confusing battle, even in the aftermath, as the officers tried to report what they did, there was no certain landmark to say we were at this particular spot at the time of the fighting. The reports from the wilderness actually are quite confusing as to where everybody did because the fighting was so confusing. What added to the horror of this battle, unlike any other, was the fires. Uh, the dry underbrush, the dry understory, quickly caught fire from shell bursts and burning powder. And unfortunately, so many of the wounded, unable to help themselves or crawl away from the field, either smothered or burned to death. Uh, several accounts from veterans of both sides talk about the horror that night of hearing the wounded crying for help in the woods as they slowly burned to death and could not be reached by their comrades and their friends. Those, um, one Confederate from South Carolina, I believe, said those cries of dying soldiers echoed him. He wrote that 40 years after the war. They still echoed in his ears that long afterwards. 
uh, again, about the isolationism. You're isolated in the wilderness, and this is maybe signatory of the type of fighting that occurred there. This scene by Winslow Homer was painted several years after the war uh, when he was living in Maine, and the trees and like that are very typical of the types of forests you see in Maine, not Virginia, but one thing it does show is the type of isolation these soldiers felt fighting in that thickly wooded area of the wilderness. The confusion, the fighting went on for two days with no results. What was Grant doing this entire time? Well, May 5th, he spent most of the time around Meade's headquarters, letting Meade direct the battle, because Meade was the commander of the Army of the Potomac. Grant had very little influence, maybe he made a few suggestions of where to move troops, where to bring in supplies, and that's it. Unfortunately, during the day, he also had a terrible migraine set in. It, it, it was so bad, he went to lay down in a nearby tent. The reporters that were hanging around the Army Potomac headquarters, one of the reporters saw this and wrote, well, Grant's drunk again, lying in a tent. That was one of the first dispatches that came out of the Army. Grant is drunk again, lying in a tent. And he actually was suffering from a migraine headache. The next day, Grant was seen again walking around headquarters or leaning against a tree wearing these gloves simply whittling throughout the day as the battle raged no more than a mile and a half away. Uh, I think the most signatory event that afternoon occurred around 6 o'clock when John Gordons saw a break in the Union line and led a counterattack north of the Orange <laughs> Turnpike that actually threw back part of the 6th Corps and part of the 5th Corps and men came tumbling back into Army headquarters area. Even staff officers came riding back with these tales of, oh my gosh, we're being turned. Lee's done it again. He's going to come up behind us. He's going to roll us back. And one officer who was supposedly a brigadier general rode up, his horse frothing, and said, I've seen this before. Lee is going to turn our flank. He's going to cut us off from the river. Uncharacteristically, Grant, who is very calm, usually doesn't show much emotion, turns to this officer and tells him, some of you always seem to think he, Lee is suddenly going to turn a double somersault and land in our rear and on both flanks at the same time. Go back to your command and try to think what we are going to do ourselves instead of what Lee is going to do. That alone, outburst, says something about Grant's focus. I don't care what Lee is doing. I don't care what you think he's going to do. He's not a magician. He's a man. He's a general in charge of a small army, and we can beat him if you're willing to do so. Results of the wilderness are not good for either army. Army Potomac loses between 15 to 18,000 officers and men in two days of fighting there. May 7th, there's not a lot going on. It's pretty much lines are stagnant. The men are willing to just lay behind their earthworks that they've thrown up along the roads or through the woods and not do much fighting at all. Only the skirmishers taking a couple pot shots at each other, especially up in Saunders Field. What strategy are you now? What do you do now? Grant and Meade confer that morning, and Grant points him in the direction of where you're going to go. Issues the orders to Meade, Meade issues orders to his corps commanders, the corps commanders then pass their orders down. A little after 6 p.m., word passes the men are supposed to pack their belongings, get their knapsacks on, and be prepared to go. The Second Army Corps is stationed along the Brock Road, north-south road, leading from the wilderness to Spotsylvania. The Fifth Army Corps packs their bags, forms in the road. The Sixth Corps, about an hour later, packs their bags, puts their knapsacks on, marches towards Chancellorsville and Fredericksburg. And what are these men thinking? Well, the rumblings of the rank is, Lee has done it again. We're going back across the river. We're going to lick our wounds. We're going to reinforce, rearm, and come across the river once again. Lee has done it again. We've been beaten in the wilderness once again. The morale in the Army is at an all-time low. As the Fifth Corps starts to march down the Brock Road, they come to the intersection with the Orange Plank Road, one of the older roads, through the wilderness area. And they march behind the Second Corps. The men are just sullenly laying against their earthworks, also packing their knapsacks and blanket rolls, adjusting their canteens and haversacks, watching the columns march by. As they come to that crossroad, they realize 
if they turn left to head to Chancellorsville, back to Ely's Ford, back across the river. Meanwhile, the men of the Sixth Corps are marching towards the old Chancellorsville battleground, passing through it, realizing, well, we're going to Fredericksburg. If we turn left, we're going to U.S. Ford. We're going right back to the Salem Church battlefield we were at a year before, and from there defeat and go right across the river again. It's all over. Lee has done it again. I cannot describe it any better than Bruce Catton, who wrote about this in his book, Still in the Appomattox, What Happened That Night. The road was crowded. Nobody could see much, but as the men trudged along, it suddenly came to them, this march was different. There was crowding at the edge of the road, mounted aides ordering, give way to the right, and a little cavalcade came riding by as easy jingling trot. And there, just recognizable, was Grant, riding at the, in the lead, with his staff following him. The Army had known dramatic moments of inspiration in the past, massed flags and many bugles and broad blue ranks spread out in the sunlight, leadership bearing a drawn sword and riding a prancing horse. Now there was nothing more than a bent shadow in the night, a stoop-shouldered man who was saying nothing to anyone, methodically making his way to the head of the column. The tired column came, came alive, and a wild cheer broke the night. Men tossed their caps in the darkness. They had their fill, it had their fill of desperate fighting, and this pitiless little man was leading them into nothing except more fighting. But at least, he was not leading them back in sullen acceptance of defeat. And somewhere, many miles ahead, there would be victory for those who lived to see it. As Grant approached Brock Road, the intersection, the men of the Fifth Corps arrived there, and they were ordered to go south. What would you do if you had been fighting an enemy for two years, and you know you're going to retreat, when suddenly somebody comes up and says, no, we're not going to quit? How would you feel? Cheer. They cheered. And all of a sudden, you might as well have just given each man a cup of sugar. <laughs> because they were exhilarated after fighting two days. Exhaustion didn't mean a thing. One veteran wrote, the exhaustion ran out of my body like fluid. And we were all spirited. The drums picked up. Men cheered. Boys tossed their caps in the air. Because we knew now we were going to take Lee to task. We were going to defeat him. We were finally going to show him what we were made of. We were going to fight him. And that was thanks to Ulysses S. Grant. So there's a determination. There is a turning point right there, that little innocuous crossroads in the wilderness. James McPherson, in his uh, book, Battle Cry of Freedom, also referred to this particular event uh, saying Grant had told Lincoln that whatever happens, there'll be no turning back, and no truer words were spoken. Uh, as one veteran said, we were not skedaddling after all. Uh, our spirits rose uh, this moment when we marched free men and began to sing. Another man just said, thank God we're getting out of this gloomy wilderness. So everybody had a different attitude. By May 21st, the Army had been through a week and a half of intense combat at Spotsylvania Courthouse. Again, Lee had been able to stop the Army of Potomac from advance on Richmond, uh, thwarted him, could not break the line. Grant again ordered another sliding motion around Lee's positions there, headed towards Richmond. On May 21st, he had a meeting of the, all the staff officers at Massaponax Church, which is still there in, in Spotsylvania County, Virginia. And a matter of fact, the original pews that these officers sat on is still in the church. There's a series of photographs taken by Timothy O'Sullivan from the peak of the church of the officers gathering out there. And in all three, uh, Grant is seen writing a dispatch. He's up behind Meade talking. She's pointing out something on the map. But one of the most particularly interesting parts of those images is this one right here. This is a blow up of Grant quietly sitting amid all the chaos, smoking a cigar. That's one of the few images ever taken of Grant holding a sword. He usually left his sword uh, with the baggage. So it's interesting he even had a sword in his hand that day. But you have to wonder, what is he thinking? What, what is he thinking at that moment? Because after two weeks of heavy fighting that the Army of the Potomac has suffered almost 20,000 casualties, more in this heavy fighting, more troops are coming in, but now he still cannot get a hold of Lee long enough to just beat him to a pulp. And now he's got to keep moving, keep moving south. 
that goes right back to the adage of how, what Grant thought. He'd been thwarted at Todd's Tavern between Spotsylvania Courthouse and the Wilderness because baggage wagons got in the way, blocked the road, the infantry couldn't get to Spotsylvania in time, Confederates arrived first. And he even wrote later in 1885 in his memoirs that accident often decides the fate of battle. It's accidents that you will decide one way or the other whether you are the victor or you are defeated. He carries that philosophy, I think, throughout the war. Um, at this time, is Grant mindful of the losses of the army? Is he thinking about what Sherman is doing in North Georgia? Do you think about what Butler is doing on the peninsula outside of Richmond? Do you think about Nathaniel Banks in Louisiana? Do you think about the Red River campaign? What is he thinking? I think he's concentrating at this point on I've got to get a hold of Lee. I'm going to find Lee and never let go of him. But you also have to wonder, too, what is Lee thinking? What is Robbie Lee thinking May 21st, 1864, as again the Army of the Potomac is packing up their bags, slinging their knapsacks, and trying to march around his flank again? What is Lee thinking of this guy? He can't figure this one out. He's not like all the others. He's not one to accept defeat and walk away from the battlefield with defeat on his shoulders to rebuild. He actually is the winner. Well, often people argue that the Battle of the Wilderness is a draw. Grant loses the Battle of the Wilderness. Not in Grant's mind. If anything, withdrawing and continuing the campaign towards Richmond, fighting Lee again, getting a hold of him, and fighting Lee, he is the victor. He takes victory out of that battle of the wilderness. And maybe that's why that is another turning point, a major turning point of the American Civil War. Grant never really wrote um, much about this or the importance of this particular event on May 7th, the way I look at it, the way others look at it. Uh, he did not really write it in his, until he's 1885. Unfortunately, when he was dying, did he write his memoirs. For those of you who don't know a lot about the history of General Grant after the war, his fame, bring Lee to, to, uh, to surrender at Appomattox Courthouse, for president for two terms, after he went into business with an unscrupulous business partner, and in 1882, I believe it was, lost every last cent he had or 1884, I believe, he lost every last cent he had. Family was destitute. He was offered, at the time he was living in New York, he was offered by Century Magazine publishers to write a few articles, and for a little bit of a modest income, he wrote several articles for the Century Magazine, which some of you might recognize as battles and leaders of the Civil War. Uh, it was at that time that a good friend of his, Mark Twain, visited and said, you should really write your memoirs. People want to know what you thought as general of the armies, as a victor for the Union, the Civil War. And Grant was kind of intrigued by this because he started to enjoy writing. It was quite a good hobby for him, and he enjoyed writing his, his and he was a good writer. It wasn't bad at all. If you've ever read Grant's memoirs, and I have to admit, I have read most of it, not all of it, I read most of it, it's excellent. Just the way he writes, it, it, it takes you into the story exactly the way his mind is reading. So he begins to write. Unfortunately, that same month, he notices he has a lot of pain in his throat, the back of his back, uh, back of his shoulders. Goes to the doctor, he has an operable throat cancer. Years of smoking cigars have finally taken their toll on General Grant. The diagnosis is not good. It's going to kill him eventually. So with a fervor, he then sits down and writes his memoirs. Feverishly, he works through November, January, February. He has his uh, son, Fred, and a former army clerk, uh, Adam Badeau, I think his fellow's name was, to assist him. Badeau was a writer to himself. He was also, a, he had been a minister under Grant's presidential administration, was a pretty good writer himself. And Badeau was a, editing the manuscript daily, giving Grant information. And in March, as Grant is really getting sick, he demands more money because there are rumors floating around the papers that Badeau is actually the ghostwriter for Grant's memoirs. And Badeau wants to take advantage of that. He demands not just more money for his contract, but he also wants part of the royalties from the publication of the book. Grant is writing this to save his family. And to be treated this way 
backstab this way is almost too much for the general. He immediately fires Badov, has him thrown out of the house, and his health then begins to rapidly decline. By mid-May, third week of May, he can hardly, he cannot speak, he can hardly walk, has constant pain throughout the day, still has his migraine headaches. Uh, he is a physical wreck, but he still feverishly sits and writes every day. Doctors finally recommend that he goes to this hotel in upstate New York. The air is a little bit better than New York City. He and his family pack, they go there, and there he sits on the porch daily and writes, works on his memoirs. At night, his son Fred looks over what he's written, makes a few minor editorial changes, and then it goes into regular, the pile for publication. Uh, he finally finishes this incredible memoir, puts his pen down, two days later passes away. July 23rd, 1885. Ulysses S. Grant is gone. They hoped to initially sell about 2,000 copies. Sold over 30,000 copies in the first run. It was an incredible demand for his memoirs. The family from the royalties made almost half a million dollars, saving the Grant family from financial wreck, financial ruin. Uh, Grant never lived to see it. But he did that as a contribution to his family. Not just a contribution to his family, but also in his memoirs, which unique is that he dedicated his memoirs to the memory of the American soldier who fought in the American Civil War. He explained to his brother Fred, who asked him, why don't you just dedicate it to the Union soldiers and, and sailors? Grant explained, I dedicate it to men of both sides, those we fought with and those we fought against to help with the healing of this nation. Because very much the United States was still divided by sexual feeling as late as 1885. And Grant knew that. And hoped that his memoirs at least would have some sense of healing the nation and bringing the nation back together. As he wrote, the art of war is simple enough. You find out where your enemy is, get at him as soon as you can, strike him as hard as you can, and keep moving on. I think that basically signifies his philosophy and his strategy in 1864 that ultimately leads in that long road to Appomattox Courthouse. And it's the Army of the Potomac, the Army of the James that follow him to the ultimate end, an ultimate victory, an ultimate peace in this country. So this little crossroads, the Brock Road, Orange Plank Road today, you can drive right by it, not even know it's there. <coughs> not even know it's there not really realize the significance of what happened at Crossroad even on May 7th. The spiritual thing it did to the men of the Army of the Potomac, not the officers, I'm talking about the enlisted men, those who had been in the trenches, those who did all the dirty work, all the dirty fighting, what happened at that Crossroads that night meant more to them than probably any other event of the war. Because finally we've got a general who's gonna lead us to victory and lead us to the very end. In um, 2013, uh, Chris Mikowski, he has a great blog called Emerging Civil War, and he wrote about this. I have to admit that in 1976, when I first went to Fredericksburg, Spotsylvania, National Military Park as a young park ranger, uh, I spent a lot of time in the wilderness because I was always fascinated with the Overland Campaign. I'd read part of Grant's memoirs in college. I'd read uh, several books. This is long before Gordon Ray and several others came along. But what fascinated me about the Battle of the Wilderness in the aftermath is that one particular paragraph from Bruce Catton's Stillness at Appomattox. What particularly happened there? And I thought at that time, maybe this is a turning point, if not the turning point of the Civil War, at least here in the East. Chris Mikowski, remarkably, wrote a very interesting blog post in 2013 arguing almost the same point. If you ever read Emerging Civil War blog, uh, it's excellent. If you haven't, look it up. Google it. It's, it's really, really good. But uh, Chris writes, had Grant turned back after coming to grief in the wilderness, then the wilderness would have been yet one more, string, one more in a string of Union losses. It was Grant's determination to press the issue southward rather than retreat and resupply, refit and reinforce, as had all previous Union commanders had done after a hard knock. That was the game changer. His intent was to shift the strategic objective of the war, focusing on the grim arithmetic he was going to grind down Lee's army through attrition, because there was no other way to do it. 
And he adds, Brock Road, Orange Plank Road intersection represents the war's real turning point because there was, quite literally, in Grant's view, no turning back. Abraham Lincoln shared the same view. There was no turning back, as did the soldiers in the Army of Potomac, and for that matter, the soldiers in the Army of Northern Virginia. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to try and take them. I don't know everything. I can make stuff up. But thanks for coming this afternoon. I hope you enjoy your visit to the Gatesburg National Military Park.